Hey, how you doing? I hope you're doing well. I hope you feel like you're well in control of your life, that you got this, and that nothing really throws you too hard. A lot of people don't feel that way, though. A lot of people struggle with mental health. And the thing that inspires this video is a friend of mine posted on social media recently that everything, it, it, it seems so hopeless, and she's so depressed. A lot of people are feeling that way. And a lot of people stay in that state for a long time. Uh, she's one of these people that will frequently make mention that, uh, oh, I'm, I'm really having a mental health day today. Oh, I, I, I need to uh, take some time to get myself in a better place. Yeah. There was a uh, episode of the Bob Newhart show years back where Bob Newhart was a psychotherapist and a woman comes into his clinic worried about her uh, irrational paranoia. And Bob Har Newhart says, I'll fix that for five bucks. And she's like, five dollars? He goes, yep, five dollars, and I don't give change. So tell me about your problem. And she says, well, I feel paranoid in these certain situations and uh, what what should I do about it and Bob Newhart just says stop it just stop don't do that five bucks <laughs> that's funny and it's funny because mm, there's a grain of truth to it now if you're not feeling like you got your life in control one of the things that people often pursue is therapy Go talk to a therapist. And for some people, talking to a therapist or getting on mood control medication, I'm sure is very helpful. And I can understand that talking to a therapist can really make a big difference because you get to talk to somebody with an outsider's perspective, somebody with hopefully decent problem-solving skills, and maybe the therapist can help reframe your situation for you help you look at it from a different angle. And from that other angle, maybe that gives you some perspective as to how to navigate the issues. I can understand that. Of course, I also know people who have gone to therapists and they go to the therapist for month after month after month, year after year. And they never really get a whole lot better. They don't get their root cause issues fixed. But to them, it's worth it because they're willing to pay a good hourly rate to have a rational friend who hmm, maybe has the courage to say, um, you know, the problem, it might be you. Maybe you're the problem, okay? And these folks oftentimes end up getting really good at uh, articulating the cause of their issues. And maybe they build themselves a story as to why they are the way they are, and it's not their fault. And then, of course, a lot of these folks also become experts in that sort of thing, and they think, maybe with this knowledge I have, I should go help other people and help addicts or something. Sure. Okay. But if you really want to fix your situation, well, those things might be helpful. But I want to give you a couple of tools that I think actually do address some of the root causes. They're super easy, doesn't take a lot of effort, and it'll turn your life around. Now, of course, everybody's got unique challenges, and unique challenges require unique situations, and one size doesn't fit all. But I think that this might help a lot of folks. And of course, even the strongest people out there can take a real gut punch and be thrown into a total tailspin when some things happen in their lives. You lose a good friend or a family member or a beloved pet. Maybe you lose a job that you were really proud of and that you loved. And these things can be devastating. But hopefully, if you're strong enough, you can examine that situation, give it its due attention, and then at some point, 
hopefully fairly soon, put it into its own package, stick it up on the shelf, and maybe revisit it every once in a while when you need to, but you can move on. Okay. All right, so let's talk about a couple of things you can do to really improve the quality of your life. Simple exercises. The first one is to develop a practice of meditation. Now this is very, very simple. If you've never meditated before, I'll talk about some techniques that you can use to, to do this. And so take a moment out of your day, each day, to just find your center and meditate. And you could do this as part of your morning routine. You could do it before you go to bed, maybe during your lunch break. But pick whatever works for you and pick a segment of time that's, well, at least 10 minutes. 15 would be better. 30 would be better yet. But, of course, we can't sit and meditate all day unless you are some spiritual guru on the mountain. Most of us have to get some work done. So you don't have to spend a whole bunch of time doing this. Just a few minutes out of your day, 10 or 15 minutes, would probably be a great place to start. And all you need to do is to shut the heck up. Just shut up. Calm the heck down and shut up. And that's all that meditation is. You don't need to go to Nepal and seek a spiritual guru to learn how to meditate. You don't need to go buy some expensive book. You don't need to go listen to some bozo on YouTube prattle on about how to meditate. Um, anyway, let me tell you how to meditate. It's very simple. There are numbers of ways you can do this and do whatever works for you. There's no right or wrong way to reach this goal. And, of course, try different things to see what really fits you best. Here's what I do. First, I find a relatively peaceful, quiet area. It's pretty difficult to meditate when you're in the audience of a football game. So go to a quiet spot and get into a comfortable position. Now, we're not trying to go to sleep. We're not going to relax and snooze off. We're actually going for awakened and heightened awareness. So you want to be bright and alert for this exercise, not zoning off and sleepy. So I wouldn't pick personally, for me, a chair that is all squishy that I just kind of lounge back in or laying down. You might be able to lay down and do this, you know, if that works for you. But what works best for me is a comfortable chair where I sit more or less bolt upright. A nice, comfortable desk chair. You don't want to be uncomfortable. You want to be very comfortable. No pain, but just sitting up straight in an alert, heightened awareness position. And then all you need to do is probably close your eyes so you get less distractions and think of nothing. Empty, velvet black space and silence. And just sit in that mode of absolute nothingness and silence for 10 or 15 minutes. Yeah, that's easier said than done, isn't it? Because if you're like me, up in here, there's a nonstop circus carnival ripping all day long. Voices in your head saying, hey, check this out. Imagine that. Wow. Could you do this? Well, yeah. Oh, boy, she's she's a problem. Uh, oh, that guy's cool. Yeah. No, no, no. You got to turn all that stuff down. And that can be a challenge. And that is one of the things that you'll get better at in time as you practice meditation. Now, there are some meditation exercises, especially if you're not real experienced at this, that might help you calm your mind down. Uh, some things that you might consider would be when you close your eyes, maybe you could imagine one thing. Now, we'd like to imagine nothing at all. That's ideal. But if we can't do that, well, then we focus on 
one thing. And that one thing tends to push out some of the calafony going on in your mind. So maybe you close your eyes and you just imagine velvet blackness with one star far away. And you're not getting any closer. You're not getting any further. There's just that one star out in the sky. And you can see it. You can definitely see it. It's right there. And so just focus on that one point and don't let anything distract you from that. Okay, sure. Maybe you want to do a mantra, which is just repeat some phrase to yourself over and over and over again so that your focus is on that and these side thoughts that are creeping in get kind of pushed away because you're focusing on this one phrase. Doesn't matter what the phrase is. You could choose something in some obscure language that some foreign guru uses if you want. If you're a Christian, maybe you want to pick something like God is love. God is love. I don't know. Maybe you could do something that's positive and self-affirming. I am awesome. I am awesome. Or I got this. Something like that. Whatever you like. But just repeat that over and over to keep the noise pushed aside. Now, as you try to meditate and you try to experience this empty, blank, quiet space, thoughts are going to come into your mind. Things are going to just start popping up. And if you wrestle with those thoughts and start getting into this, no, 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 go away, go away. Well, then you start going down this circle and that's not what we want to do. So instead, if a thought pops up, I just sort of hmm, look at it from the side and I don't engage with it. You know, if a thought pops up about your brother, well, don't start going down that track of, ah, oh, he's a great guy. He's always there for me. Oh, I worry about his son. <sighs> yeah, I wonder what he's going to do about that job situation. No, 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 no. Just go, hmm, brother, huh? Okay. And let it slide away. Don't engage with it. Just look at it and let it go on its way. Now, before I do my meditation exercise, this is also a good time to ask for a little clarification from your higher self your inner self. And so before I go into that exercise, not always, but sometimes, I'll just ask myself a question that I want to get some clarity on. And usually it's the big overarching questions like, what's really happening in this situation? Or maybe is Moving to Arkansas, really the thing I should do right now? You know, those sorts of questions. And during your meditation, don't expect to suddenly get some enlightened answer. But you may find that afterwards, with a little bit of time, the right thing to do just comes to you. I do believe that our subconscious, our spiritual guidance, is there to help us out. And if we sincerely ask it, it will show us a sign. And it usually communicates in the form of symbology. So, you know, don't expect to do some automatic writing and wake up to a journal that tells you a step-by-step -step process. But if you pay attention to the signs, hmm, you might get an answer. Okay, so that's step one. Each day, if you can, take a little bit of time for yourself. Not a lot of time, 15 minutes, 30 minutes maybe, and just calm down, find your center, and meditate. And like I mentioned, the way that I usually do it is I will try to find a chair where I can sit with good posture that's comfortable, in a room that's comfortable, and I'll just close my eyes and I will imagine a silver cable moving right straight up through my body, through my head, onto infinity in the sky. And I just focus on that pipe, that conduit, 
And I think, connect me to the intelligence of the greater consciousness. Help me understand what's happening here. Help me find my center. And after 10 or 15 minutes of that, I usually find myself in a much more calm situation. It, it helps all of that stuff in your mind settle down and get sorted out. And you'll probably find that you handle things in a more measured, reasonable way. You have a deeper understanding. I think that's really useful, really important. And simple. Now there's another exercise that I suggest, and this one gets well, a little bit spiritual woo-woo. And a whole bunch of people are probably going to say, that is absolutely a ridiculous, silly idea. <laughs> you are so bonkers. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And it doesn't matter if this is true or not. Because I think it's a working model. That is, this model, whether or not it's actually representative of what things really are, doesn't matter. But if you follow this model, the results work. Okay, And I'm not trying to clash with anybody's notion of religion here. I think that this is compatible with just about everybody's religion. I'm not making any enormous claims. A little bit of context. Imagine, if you will, that everywhere around us there are frequencies in the sky that carry music. And with the right equipment, you can tap into those frequencies. That right equipment is called a car radio. You turn the radio on, you'll hear music. Well, or maybe sportscast or something, but that energy of those things is floating in the air. You can't smell it, you can't taste it, you can't touch it, but it's out there. And we know it's out there because your radio works. Let's imagine that your brain is a radio. We think about a bunch of stuff. We have these memories. And where are those things? Well, a bunch of our folks would say, well, you know, memories are stored in the brain, and we have all of these synoptic connections and neurons, and, and this is how we analyze data. And uh, we, uh, you know, when you're hearing these voices in your head saying you should do this or do that or whatnot, that, that, that's all coming from here, you know, it's all right in your brain, your brain sorting it out and doing all it. Could be. But let's imagine that instead of it working like that, your brain is more of a radio transmitter and receiver and maybe it does some filtering and control and a little bit of analyzation but basically it's a radio set and it is connecting you and your consciousness to the greater conscious field of the world and within that greater conscious field that everybody is connected to is the greater you the overarching spiritual you, the real you. And the part of the you that's right down here on Earth running around, well, maybe we're kind of like an avatar in a video game, whereas the greater you is up there watching all this occur. Maybe. Something like that. Now, what evidence do we have of this? Well, first, the medical establishment, a lot of them would probably say, oh, that's just a whole bunch of hooey. You know, we can prove it. We can prove it because we can take an EEG machine and put all these contacts on your brain. And then when you think about this or that or the other thing or you have this emotion, we see those signals bouncing all over the place. So we can see that there's activity in the brain over here, over here, and it's all happening right in the brain. I mean, we can see the electrical activity in the brain. You know, don't be an idiot. And to them, I would say, well, let's put your fancy EEG electronic monitoring system 
on a radio. And as I tune around with the radio, I hear country music, rock and roll music, sports casting. And every time I tune into one of those stations, or between the stations, I see a whole bunch of different electrical activity all bouncing around inside of that radio set. But that doesn't mean that the radio set is producing the music. Uh, the radio doesn't make the music. It just passes it through from picking up out there. And it too has a whole variety of varying signals depending upon what it's picking up. So, to me, that, that proves nothing. We could also say that um, there's proof of this by the hundredth monkey effect. And I encourage you to look up the hundredth monkey effect, also the double slit experiment. Now, the double slit experiment was a physics experiment done quite a long time ago where they were shooting particle beams at slits and seeing which way the particle would go through the slits. And you can investigate this, it's fascinating, but it was discovered that if an observer, a conscious entity, was watching this experiment happen, the experiment would behave in a certain way. But if nobody was watching it, if the room was empty and the experiment was just running in an empty room and nobody was paying any attention to what's happening, nobody had any measurement devices recording that outcome, the outcome was different. It was more random. So it was like once consciousness entered into the equation, the randomness factor declined. It's like we are defining the universe. Hmm. Hundredth monkey effect was where researchers were researching the behavior of monkeys on an island. And they watched this group of monkeys for a significant amount of time. And the monkeys, after a while, started developing a clever new technique for getting to their food. And this technique took a while for that group of monkeys to all adopt. Uh, some of them picked it up at first, and after a while, more and more monkeys on that island started doing this new uh, food processing technique. N something that wasn't obvious. It was clever. And so, the monkeys that figured it out first taught the monkeys that didn't know. And after a little while, almost all the monkeys on the island were doing this new thing. Okay, that makes sense. But what was curious is that monkeys on other islands that had no connection whatsoever with the monkeys on the original island where this behavior started happening started doing it too at the same time. So it was as if the monkeys on the first island learned this technique and it went into the conscious field then monkeys in other parts of the world who are also tapped into that conscious field learned this knowledge. It's pretty powerful evidence that we're all connected to each other and that maybe there is a field of consciousness that we all are connected to. Another example of this which is less scientific, is I think most of us, we can feel the vibe. Maybe you uh, wake up one morning and you're in a pretty good mood and you walk into work and as soon as you step in the doors, you feel it, and something's up, nobody's happy. And after being there for an hour or so, well, you kind of get that heavy feeling too. It's like, oh, Monday. Damn. Because everybody around you is feeling, uh, Monday. Damn. One more example. It's been a long, hard week at work, and you are really spent. You get home finally, and you plop down in the chair and just go, oh my, I'm so tired. Oh, goodness. Oof, glad that week is done. 
Then the phone rings. It's your buddy. And he says, hey, how you doing? Hey, everybody's waiting for you. When are you going to get to the party? 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 Oh, yeah, he mentioned he was having a party earlier this week, and I, I said I'd come. Um, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, hey, I just got to take care of a couple things, and uh, I'll be right over. Sorry I'm late. So you head over that way to the party, and on the way to the party, you're thinking, well, this will be, it'll be good to catch up with some of these folks, but um, oh, I'm just really feeling so tired. I'll uh, make a couple rounds at the party, and I'm, I'm going to cut out early. I, I can't do this. You get to the party, you open the door, and people greet you. Everybody's happy to see you. Oh, it's been so long, man. It's great to see you. How you been? What's going on? Hey, let me grab you a drink. What do, what do you want? And uh, you're hanging out with people, and they're all excited to see you, and it's really a happy vibe, and it's good times. And next thing you know, 30 minutes later, an hour later, you're laughing and whooping it up with your buddies, and everybody's cool, and it's a fantastic evening, and you've totally forgotten about all those stress and worries of the work week. And next thing you know, it's getting on about 2 a.m. And it's like, oh man, I, I, I've got to get home. I mean, this, this is getting really late and you stayed all night long and had a fabulous time. And so once you stepped into that environment where everybody's in a happy vibe, well, you picked up that vibe too and joined the fun. Uh, this is probably why people enjoy going to sports games and rock and roll concerts and political rallies where you get all of these people wound up with a happy vibe and that's contagious. And the idea that all of us are feeding into and pulling down from a universal field of consciousness, well, maybe that makes some sense. So what is in that field of consciousness. Well, our conscious vibration, the essence of who we are and how we're feeling. We feed into it, we pull out of it, and other people who are in a similar state to us, fairly close, we pick up their energy too. So it's sort of like a FM radio band, you might think, where you can tune around with your emotions and if your emotion is at this particular point well you're going to kind of ring and resonate and feed into and pull energy out of other people who are in roughly that same vibrational space what else could be in the conscious field well maybe your higher self the greater you is up there and the greater you might be feeding you a little bit of information once in a while. Maybe it's that little voice in your head that gives you some good guidance once in a while, saying, hmm, pay attention to this, or be careful here. Hey, you got this. There's nothing to be afraid of. The greater you, your higher self, the real essence of you, your ultimate consciousness, loves you. It's part of you. There's nobody that loves you more than your higher self and wants the very, very best for you. Uh, that higher consciousness would never want you to fail, would never want you to feel bad, it wants you to grow and thrive and be successful and be everything that you can evolve to be. So it's always got your back. It's always supportive. And so if it sends a little voice down into the back of your head saying, hey, you're pretty cool today. And uh, by the way, pay attention. Be careful of this. Well, follow your instinct on this one, okay? Just saying. Or if uh, you make a big mistake, maybe that inner voice would whisper to you, I tried to warn you, 
I told you, watch out for the signs. So be a little more careful next time, okay? But hey, you did the best you could with what you were working with at the time, but yeah, be careful. Watch those signs. Sure. Would that voice insult you or be nasty? No. It would treat you like a, your very, very best friend. And if your very best friend screwed something up, well, you're not going to just stand there and say, you're never going to get this. You're just such an idiot, such a total failure. Come on. Now, you might say that in a completely frivolous, joking way, but you wouldn't mean it to somebody you really loved. But sometimes we get those thoughts in our head. Those thoughts come creeping into our head of, oh, this is hopeless. I really screwed this one up again. I'm never going to figure this out. Yeah. So where's that coming from? Is that coming from you? Are you really creating those thoughts? Hmm. Well, here's an idea for you. Maybe inside of the conscious field there are other entities. Hmm? Maybe there are viruses in the conscious field. Yeah, you know, viruses, like somebody gets a thought form and it replicates and it grows and it gets passed around to various people. And some of those thought viruses are really good ideas, like maybe that hundredth monkey effect. And other people pick up that idea and go, hmm, yeah, okay. And they take it and they run with it. But maybe some of these thought viruses aren't so nice. Maybe there's some negative energy out there that's splattering around, bouncing around, and you just tune your radio in and pick up that static. Maybe there's malevolence and there's viruses and energies out there that, for whatever reason, think it's kind of fun to play a prank on people, mess with people, maybe. But who's driving this bus that's your life? Well, it's you are. And we are sovereign beings. We have the right to manage our conscious field any way we want to. We can really do just about anything we want to. We can do good things. We can do evil things. Nothing's stopping us. Oh, well, of course, you know, there's causality. And so if you do terrible things to people, well, bad things might come back to you. Law enforcement might rain down on you. Or somebody might um, not enjoy the interaction and let you know. But you can do just about whatever you want. And so, when these thoughts pop into your mind of, you know, negativity self-criticism, self-doubt. Ask yourself, is this really me? Am I doing this? Would I do this to me? I don't think so. So, I think at that point you can say, well, even though it sounds like my voice, those aren't my words. I wouldn't say that to me. I wouldn't say something like that to somebody I loved. So that's crap. And if it's not coming from you, well, somebody is, something is kind of trespassing in your mental space. And as sovereign beings, nobody, nothing, no entity, no vibrational field, no consciousness has the right to mess with you. Now, if they come over and they start messing with you and you don't object to it, or you agree to it and go, oh, okay, that sounds like a fun game to play. Sure, sure. Well, okay, you've, you've agreed to the game. You want to play that game? You can play that game. But you also have the choice of saying, I don't want to play your game. I don't like what you're doing to me. And uh, you're trespassing in my mental space. And so why don't you... Get out. 
you don't have the right to mess with me. And I don't appreciate you messing with me. And you need to leave now. Don't come back. Go away. And so when that kind of negativity slides into my mind and I have some thought that I don't really resonate with, I'm like, where did this come from? You know, you get really angry at somebody or you get angry at yourself. I pause for a moment and go, would I really do that? Is that me? I don't think that's me. No, that's, that's crap. Get out of here. I don't need that kind of thought in my head. Go away. And I get a little bit indignant. Tell them just exactly where it can jump the heck off. Don't come back either. And I tell you that nine times out of ten when I do that little exercise and say, hey, you can bug off. That's not how I feel. Bullshit. Pretty quick. Like immediately. Those thoughts evaporate. And go away. Now they might come a knocking a little bit later on, or another one might come along. Sure, sure. So it's a little bit of a game of whack a mole. But the more you whack those moles, the fewer there are. And I find that if you consistently, whenever those thoughts of negativity or self doubt or feeling less than pop up, and you go, what? This? No. That's not me. That, that's somebody trying to mess with me or something. I, no, I don't, I don't connect with that. I don't resonate with that. I'm not going to tune into your radio station. I'm going to grab the old tuning knob and tune to a little hmm, higher frequency, a little better music. You can bug the heck off. Pretty instantaneously, my mood changes. Things get better. And it seems like I have fewer and fewer of those little episodes the more I do it. So that's a couple of really quick, simple, easy things that you can put into practice on a daily basis. Spend a little bit of time each day meditating. Try to connect yourself with the greater everything. Ask for a little bit of clarity. And I think you'll find that it helps simmer down all of the boiling cauldron of your mind and helps you see things in a grander way, make better decisions, and it helps give you a balance and unity. And then on top of that, cut out the self-doubt and the negative self-talk. Negative self-talk is so corrosive, and we often talk to ourselves with so much more harshness than we would dare talk to anybody else. And we're supposed to love ourselves. So stop that. Just stop that. You don't have to do that. When you find yourself doing that, just go, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't really believe that. That's nonsense. Now, I might have made a mistake there. I might have screwed something up. Nobody's perfect. It's uh, an educational process, this life. And so you do the best you can. And when you make mistakes, hopefully you learn from them and you uh, do a better effort next time. Well, folks, I hope that was helpful to you. If you put these ideas into practice sincerely every day for a couple of months, I really think it'll make a big difference in your life. And if you do that and you do have positive results from it, Hey, throw a comment down below and let me know your experience. Let me know if it helped you out. Uh, if you did take a, a truly sincere effort to try this, and after a couple of months, um, no, nah, it just didn't make a difference for you. Well, that's cool too. Let me know. I'm curious to hear how things work out for you. And if uh, these tips really do turn your life around, make things a whole lot better for you, and you find yourself going from being the custodian of the company to the vice president, well, that's fantastic. And if that's your situation and you're feeling so inclined, hey, go down into the video and click that super thanks button and hey, throw me 10 or 20 bucks. It'll be the cheapest therapy session you ever had. 
Well, okay. But I would appreciate if you'd take a moment and hit subscribe. You know, like the video if you liked it. And I appreciate hearing your feedback as to what works for you to help you navigate this crazy wildlife that we find ourselves in. Thanks for watching the video and hanging out for a while. I appreciate it. And I wish that your life is rich, rewarding, satisfying, and a source of joy to you and the people around you. Thanks for watching the video. Catch you again soon.